Uh, previously, I was at Electronic Arts. Uh, EA is a more famous gaming brand, but I've also worked at the Walt Disney Company. Um, all this time, I've been in social and mobile uh, free-to-play. So the one caveat from this talk is that I only have the experience as a gaming product manager. So I'll talk to you a lot about what I do, what we do at, at gaming companies. Keep in mind that I haven't done this at Facebook or Google or Uber, so I don't necessarily know if it's better or worse. I just know that I personally love it, and hopefully I'll get you all interested in that a little bit more. Um, here's a few of the games that I've worked on. Um, you might have played a few of them. I started over here on a game called Restaurant City. Uh, this was made by a company called Playfish that was acquired by EA in 2010 or so. Um, it was at a time where Facebook was really up and coming as a games platform. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, moved into mobile in 2010 in what we call the synchronous games, uh, Words with Friends or Draw Something are great examples where I play my turn and send it to you. Um, eventually moved on to Disney to work on Star Wars games, which was a lot of fun because it's Star Wars. Also worked on other brands like Marvel um, and Pixar and Disney Animation. Joined Zynga a couple years ago. Uh, Zynga's bread and butter is what we call live operations. We'll talk about that a lot. Uh, it is the, the crux of free to play. It is the idea that you can manage a game as a service for multiple years and make money rather than selling it up front for $60 and then forgetting it. Uh, Zynga is an expert in this. They invented the role with early games like Farmville, Cityville, Mafia Wars, all that. Um, and they've kept a lot of that expertise and it's been a blast working there with the people who started this some 10 years ago or so. Um, for context for this talk, I thought we would start with the history of free to play. Free to play or freemium is the concept that I mentioned earlier. The, the idea that you can put a software out there for free uh, and expect a lot of users to come in and interact with it, but some of them to pay at their own pace, to pay what they want for the content. The idea that a large user base and some monetization is better than um, upfront retail or, or sales. So looking back here, we'll start in the early 2000s uh, when home computers were more widespread, the internet was more accessible and faster. Um, the type of game that became very popular at the time is what we call MMOs or Massively Multiplayer Online Games. This is a screen grab from World of Warcraft, probably one of the most famous MMOs. Um, the reason I point this out is because these games were the first ones to kind of change the model a little bit. You didn't go necessarily to just buy you know, a $60 copy, go home, play it, and forget about it. You would subscribe for $15 a month and play again and again and again, and not alone. You would play with your friends. Um, the idea that you could pay for a long period of time but also get content for a long period of time is kind of where this free-to-play started because as widely popular as this was, it was not popular in Asian markets. In Asia, the issue that a lot of game developers were facing is piracy. Um, a lot of people would download these games, create fake accounts, exchange fake accounts to be able to play this content for free effectively. And as a game developer, when you have a lot of upfront costs, you need to find a solution to that. The solution that, came up, that the Asian developers came up with is free-to-play. Uh, this is a game called Maple Story. It's widely considered to be one of the first free-to-play games. Um, what they did there was, their solution to this problem was, what if we give the content for free out. Basically, we lower all the barriers to entry. You're no longer downloading or buying a software, downloading it on your machine. You access it through a browser. Um, what if we you know, lower the development costs and get it out to market faster so that we can start monetizing quicker than our competitors? It was, not, it was very popular in the, in the East. It was not popular in the West, uh, mainly because, and still to this day, the term free-to-play and freemium is not very popular with gamers in the West. Um, it became very big when Facebook allowed games on their platform. This is a screen grab from the very first Farmville game. You probably remember, or hopefully you do, all the notifications about your friend needs them to feed their cows and etc. Um, so that was Zynga uh, in its heyday, or at least in its first rise. Uh, the match between Facebook and gaming is a brilliant one if you think about it, especially free-to-play games, because you're on a browser on a website that has all your friends and family on it. So you have a network built in, and now you have the ability to interact with them in a different way. So all these game mechanics helped people, or these new game mechanics help people interact more than they would on other types of games or in a different way. This is also where the first gaming PMs appear. The role of product management, we'll talk about the responsibilities a lot later in this talk. But before this, there was an equivalent. There were people managing virtual economies and, and building forecasts and roadmaps and et cetera. It was just split across roles. You had producers doing the project management piece. You had game designer doing the, the design and the UX flows and et cetera. You didn't have the PM as a product owner, if you will. The reason they came in for me is twofold. Anecdotally, I think it's because all of this was concentrated in the Bay Area. You had Facebook down in, in um, 
uh, Mountain View and you had Zynga in San Francisco and PMs are popular and their owner and et cetera. Um, so they came in. But more importantly, this is the first time that you legitimately had the ability to track all the game actions of your players. Every single click, every single action, the time spent there, all this massive treasure trove of data was accessible to the game developers. And PMs are the ones who would come in and make sense of this data to guide the development over time. Um, and to this day, as a fun fact, there's a lot of gaming companies, very large ones on console, that do not track anything about their games. More popular games than you would think. Um, but on, on the mobile free-to-play space, we do this every single day in and out. So um, saying mention analytics, it becomes very relevant in the PM skill set. Uh, keep that in mind. Uh, fast forward a few years, the App Store is released, uh, followed by the Google Play Store. All of a sudden, not only um, can you reach people on Facebook, but you can reach them at all times in their pockets. So you have a lot of apps that go out, um, a lot of great new games that use touch interfaces like uh, Candy Crush, and they just make a killing all of a sudden. So how much of a killing? If you look at the industry in 2009, it was about 50 billion or so. I called out the Asian number of 19 to 20 billion because that's the closest I could get to a indication of what free-to-play represented. It's not the full piece of the pie, but a lot of the free-to-plays at the time came from Asia Pacific and some of that revenue is recognized there, but it's probably much smaller than that. Fast forward to 2017, the industry, I think the final number of the global games market is 108 or 110 billion. But it's already huge, right? It's, it's doubled in less than 10 years, it's massive. Mobile alone is 50 billion. So eight, 10 years, and you have a segment of the industry that didn't exist that is worth more than the entire industry used to be. That's huge, it's a huge amount of money um, to split, but there's a lot of people trying to split it. There's about, take these with a grain of salt, it's hard to find accurate numbers on the number of apps in the app store. Call it five million across tablets and, and iPads and iPhone across all the platforms, all that. Um, five million apps on these app stores. A large chunk of them are games. The vast majority of the games are the, um, or the games are the ones responsible for the vast majority of that revenue. So there is an extremely competitive market here. It's not evenly split though. Um, it's not like every game out there takes their share of the pie. Uh, let me ask you, anybody here ever pay for a free-to-play game, ever play Candy Crush or CSR or... All right, cool, well, all right, we're not very statistically representative here because in general, it's 2% of players that ever pay in a game's lifetime. Probably two to five call it, right, depending on the game and the, the type of monetization that we're talking about. Uh, that's an extremely small number of users and worse is that only 10% of them generate half of the revenue. That's 0.2%, give or take, generating that $25 billion, which is crazy when you think about a $50 billion industry being floated up by 0.2% of its users. But it's also the whole concept of free to play, right? That you reach literally billions of users. There's something like two and a half billion monthly active game players on mobile. Um, but a very small chunk of them are willing to pay. And some of them are willing to pay a lot of money. And I mean a lot. There are stories of um, people playing, but paying thousands of dollars, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars, and that's not an exaggeration. Um, individuals will pay four to five hundred thousand dollars on certain games over three to four years. It happens. Uh, it's the concept of whales. So, this is what kind of free to play is based on. This is the opportunity, the business opportunity as well. But the problem is that in such a competitive environment, you end up in a, in a hits driven industry. Not everything can survive uh, over the long term. This is my favorite example of a company called Supercell. They have four games in the App Store that have generated two and a half billion dollars in 2016. Probably a little bit more in 2017 because they made a ton of improvements. Uh, that's Clash of Clans, Boom Beach, Heyday, and Clash Royale. To get there, they killed 14 to 20 titles. They only talk about 10 or so publicly. Um, and they're extremely good at it. They know that the only chance they have to have a... All of these games are in the top 10 grossing apps uh, in, in the world. So they're extremely successful at it, but they know that most of their products will not have a very long shelf life. So where does that leave us? As a gaming PM, you're in this extremely competitive market where everybody is fighting for about 2% of players. There's a huge amount of games and com competition, but this is where you have to use your skill set to make the best possible game. What is that skill set? Um, actually, never mind. We'll get to the skill set in a second. <laughs> Um, where do you fit in in the mobile game life cycle? So first, to explain to you how do we make games. 
At a very high level, there's three main stages that we'll talk about. The first one is development. This is everything from coming up with an idea, making a pitch to the company, getting a team together, developing uh, the forecast, the design, the feature set, et cetera, that comes with it, and actually building it with engineers and artists and game designer. Um, that'll take you about six to 18 months in general. Anything longer than that, you're probably not in very good shape. Anything shorter is because you're being very aggressive. Um, after that, you wanna get it out to the hands of some players. We do that in what we call a soft launch, uh, which is getting it out in, you know, releasing it in Canada, releasing it in Australia, markets that are representative of mainly the US or the, the, um, the higher revenue generating markets. You do that for three to six months, validate your assumptions, and then do the big marketing push to launch the game worldwide. Beyond that, we start talking about live ops or this games as a service idea. Um, I think the longest game I know of is Zynga Poker, which celebrated 10 years um, last year. So yeah, it's about 10 and a half years old. There's probably some that are older on web, um, but most games will die, unfortunately, within their first year. Um, a few will get, you know, two, three years, uh, but that is still, you know, some of the games that I talked about earlier were very successful games and they died after three years or within three years, they were still hits or considered hits, especially for the company. It depends what their goals were, but you can be very profitable doing this. As a PM, where do you do this? Um, you'll notice there's a little bit more uh, layers than the typical tech company that has like a product manager and then like a, a manager of some type. Um, it's a more classic way of thinking. We'll start PMs at the associate or PM level, get them up to senior lead and, and director of product. Um, as an associate to senior, you're gonna be on the live ops part of it. This is really where you, we'll talk about this a lot, um, you get to build the skill set of the product manager. You'll cover um, all the main processes, all the main data analytics and et cetera, which gets you to understand how this live operations uh, games as a service model really works. Beyond that, you'll move away a little bit from the individual contributor role. You're still expected to you know, roll up your sleeves and get dirty every now and again, but you'll be more on a managerial level um, and you'll bring that expertise with you to development cycles or, or launch cycles where it's a bit more appropriate to have single PMs owning it. So now to the skill set. Let's break down each, um, each role and kind of what we expect you to do. So you join a gaming company, you're an associate PM. If you're joining my team, there will be three things that would have you focus on early on. Competitive analysis, what I call content management, and data analytics. Competitive analysis, this is the fun part. You will be playing a lot of games when you're at a gaming company. It kind of goes, you know, uh, as per expectations. It's a lot of fun, but it's also a lot of work. You'll be playing mainly the games that are your direct competitors. So if you join the Candy Crush team, you'll be playing every single match three game. Match three is the, the name of the genre um, that you can get your hands on. Understand what best in class is, probably Candy Crush and, and King's other games, and understand what the other newer players uh, are doing to differentiate themselves. Um, you'll be doing what we call deconstructs. There's a great blog called Deconstructor of Fun. Uh, it's the director of product at Rovio that uh, started that. He takes these games that he likes and breaks them down, everything he can about them. He'll explain every mechanic that he likes, every mechanic he doesn't like, look at some numbers to indicate what works, what doesn't work. Um, it's a great way to look at examples for this if you're curious uh, as to what a deconstruct looks like. Um, it's not only limited to your own genre. Um, the fun part about working about, at a video game company is that everybody there, or for the most part, love video games. So you will have conversations about console games like Destiny or MMOs like World of Warcraft because they share a lot of common with mobile free-to-play games. They have the same or very similar engagement loops. Uh, now more and more in games like League of Legends, you see very similar monetization loops. Um, you know, the whole, um, if you guys were keeping an eye on gaming news, there's been a controversy these past four months or so about what we call loot boxes, which is the idea that as a player, you can spend money or, or coins on a, a mystery box, a box that you don't know what's inside. You'll get something randomly dropped to you. Um, right now, the controversy is, does that count as gambling or not, right? Because EA released a Star Wars game where it was considered to be almost gambling because Star Wars is a brand that can be aimed at children. Um, well, we do the same thing in our games. We have a ton of mystery, ga uh, mystery boxes and loot boxes. So playing a lot of games comes with the role uh, of product management. Hopefully something you can enjoy because it, you know, it is fun. <laughs> Beyond that, as a PM, um, when you start, you'll be doing mostly what I call content management. Um, to define a little bit what I call content here, um, take a little bit of more of a technical uh, step back and talk about um, front end and, and back end as, as Sang mentioned. When you download a game from the app store, you download what we call the client, right? You, you install on your device a piece of code that we've submitted to Apple and Google 
as a game. Once you open up that game, it talks to our servers. So you have the client talking to the servers and from the servers, we can push content to you directly without having to go through Apple and their submission process and taking multiple days and et cetera. The reason we make a distinction between the two is because one is very quick and flexible. The content that we push to you, we can take back, we can tune, we can change numbers and files and immediately the players will see it. And the other is a little bit bigger and much slower. So early on as a PM, you'll be doing more of the content management piece. So um, you'll be the owner of everything that the players see uh, day in and day out. The reason a lot of these games can last for multiple years is because it's always something new and fresh to do in the game. Um, starting with the content, you'll familiarize yourself with the process, right? How do we go from, um, okay, Valentine's Day is coming up. What are we doing for Valentine's Day? We should do something special, right? Well, one of our designers has an idea for a bunch of new recipes for a restaurant game. This is from my first game, Restaurant City. Uh, as the name implies, you come in and you build a restaurant you collect coins and, and ingredients, and over time we give you recipes to complete. So if you have enough ingredients, you trade them in for a recipe, and over time as you complete them, you master them. Um, so this is something that we do, do every two weeks. We would sit down with the designers, say, okay, well, Valentine's Day is coming up, let's do like a French recipe theme. Uh, we'll get a bunch of assets created. We need little drawings for, well, the barbecue was probably the wrong example, but we would need you know, ribs and pulled pork and potato salad. Um, and then the PM would go in and put cost to this. How many potatoes do you need for the potato salad? How many, um, I don't know, celeries for the, the buffalo bites and so on and so forth? Um, it really gets you to understand A, the process of making a game and B, the reaction from the user base because whenever you push this content, you will see a reaction immediately. How do you see that reaction? How do you measure that reaction is the investigation part or, or more commonly known, the data analysis part. This is the most important part. This is the building blocks of what it means to be a PM in the gaming industry. So, um, I'm forgetting what my next slide is. Yes, there we go. Let's take an example here. Let's say you're an associate PM in a, a gaming company and you come in on a Monday and I say, revenue really sucked over the weekend. We need you to investigate and to look at this. Where would you start? So, thinking about it this way maybe might help um, we always look to break down metrics to get to the root cause of the problem. Um, yes, exactly, right? So revenue for us is a function of our daily active users and our average revenue per daily active user. Uh, I call this ARBDAO, you might have heard it called ARPU, something else, basically how much averaging out the, uh, the revenue per your DAU. But still, you're not getting anywhere close here, right? You might see some movement up and down, uh, but this is what I've read about this being called uh, laggard versus actionable metrics. Laggard metrics are um, basically described of anything that happens after the fact. You can't come in tomorrow and say, all right, I will turn this button on DAU and, and I will have more users, right? That's not something you can do. So you need to keep breaking these down into actually actionable metrics, things that you as a PM can go and change to have an impact all the way up this tree into revenue. In gaming, if we were to keep breaking it down, you'd start breaking down your DAU as a function of your installs, how many people come into the game every day, and your retention. How many of them come, day, come back day one, day two, day seven, day 14, day 30, right? Uh, on the revenue piece, you might think about, you know, what we talked about earlier, only 2% of people pay. Well, let's look specifically at how, in my game, how many, what percentage I'm talking about, how many payers do I have, and how many, uh, how many dollars am I getting from each of these payers, right? You can keep going like this. Installs, you could break down into, uh, you know, installs that you buy from advertising, installs that come in naturally. Retention, you could look at other metrics like um, how, how long did you spend in the game? How often do you come in per day? How often per week? And you could do the same on the, the payer piece. An example of an actionable metric, probably the simplest one, is installs because you can't really turn a knob and get more installs unless you break it down into user acquisition installs. It's usually a factor of how much money you've spent. So if you spend $1,000 a day and you get 1,000 installs, you're very lucky because that's a very good price to get installs at, uh, but you could go in, spend $2,000, that's something you have um, the power to do and get $2,000 uh, 2, installs back, right? So that's what we train PMs to do, to keep going and going until they get to these actionable metrics and solve problems with that. Either when they happen, so revenue is low, maybe, you know what, we spent a little bit less than we anticipated over the weekend and we had a dip in installs from it, less new users, less new users converting, less revenue. 
Um, or maybe you're doing it in advance, right? You want to have a big um, Valentine's Day weekend coming up. Well, let's see if we can tune any of these metrics and, and get the numbers up. This is still all math, right? These are all equations calculated together. They kind of make sense. If you see something go up, it'll go up the tree, and it's pretty easy to predict. The part that's more challenging and where we have a lot of fun as product managers is beyond that. So up here is a bunch of game features. If anybody's familiar with gaming, you might recognize some of them. Um, the problem with these features is that they're, they're fun, right? They're elements of fun. How do you measure fun? How do you trace this all the way back the tree to your revenue goal? It's extremely hard to do because when you think about a feature, they correlate with some metrics here and there, but it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. You don't put out more levels and the only thing that goes up is your revenue per paying user. That's not how it works. If you have a, a guild system, for example, uh, a guild system is the ability, it's a, it's a social mechanic, it's the ability for users in a game to come together, interact in a smaller group, uh, they can chat, they can maybe trade items, they can achieve goals together, that type of stuff. They, they might be called alliances or clans, whatever you call it, it's like a social mechanic. But if you think about that and you add that to a game, you know, what is it gonna move? Where is it gonna move the needle? It might actually impact everything across the board. You might have better retention because people come in more often because they like to chat with their friends. You might have more installs because they're having so much fun that they decide to install their friends. You might even monetize better because all these common goals are getting people to spend more and more coins in the game. As a PM, this is where you're supposed to go in and dig through Quite a bit of data to be honest and figure out where is the needle moving and why because if you know how to do this then you can control your game and you can control the direction of your business before we move on the last thing i'll say about this again data analytics you will be looking at a ton of data um, on a regular basis the important piece remember is that numbers can tell the truth they can also tell whatever you want them to tell <laughs> keep this in mind because it is an instinct to say, you know, you run an A-B test to validate a hypothesis, you know, maybe guilds will work or not. You can probably make it say, make the, the report say that, you know, it worked, I did a good job, great. But in the long run, you probably wanna make it say the truth and then figure it out from there. Um, just a piece of advice. <laughs> Moving on, um, when you start graduating a little bit from associate to product manager to senior product manager, you're starting to think a little bit longer term. So the pieces, the, the new challenges for you are more strategy driven, uh, mainly on the content piece, which is building on the content management side, and you get into the feature design. So let's start with content strategy. Um, you know, once you're familiar with the industry, with the competitive landscape, uh, and your game in particular, both its data uh, and its content, you're in a pretty good position to answer the question, you know, what are my players gonna do tomorrow and in a month and in a year? So that's where we anticipate PMs to put together strategy, um, to delight players over time and get them to ideally stay, come back, and convert. It's more complex than just saying, hey, I'm gonna run a sale because Valentine's Day is coming up, right? Um, if you run a sale, for instance, on potatoes, like my earlier example of recipes, cool, everybody will buy more over Valentine's Day because they get twice as many potatoes. But if you think about it, if there's no other way for them to spend potatoes over the long term, they just won't spend the week after and the week after that because they have enough potatoes. So as a PM, you have to say, what can I put in there that will drain these potatoes out of the economy? Simplistic example, right? But putting together these different in-game events, sales, new content, that's how you get the live ops cadence as we talk of, of you know, weekend after weekend, you'll have people spending, people engaging, and you'll see these graphs that slightly over time go up. That's your end goal here, right? You want people to engage over long periods of time and keep finding interesting content and not going over and downloading another game and starting to play that instead. Um, that can be a key, if not the most important part of game development. Um, it can be extremely effective and not having this can make or break your game. On the other hand, sometimes you can't just solve everything with just content, right? We talked about content being pushed from the server it's usually quick, but it's also limited. You could go in and change numbers and make your recipe you know, cost twice as many potatoes, um, but that might not solve everything. At times, you need to make these bigger and bolder changes in the game. And that's where we talk about feature design more. Um, features or mechanics, uh, whatever you want to call them, they're much costlier in terms of time and resourcing, uh, but can have the opportunity to be much more impactful because they kind of, they change the logic of how the, the game can work. 
as a PM, once you identify a problem that you don't believe can be solved with uh, pure content, it's your role to say, here's an idea. Here's a way to solve this problem that I've either seen in a competitor, that I've seen in you know, a, a non-gaming competitor, or that I just came up with. You'll work with a game designer to flesh that out, to build a spec, to do wireframes, mockups, all the classic PM stuff, work with engineers to implement it and build it. And then we'll get back to our data analysis piece by actually releasing the feature and examining whether it did what you wanted it to do. I'm gonna take a parenthesis to talk about one of my favorite examples of phenomenal feature design. Um, these are characters from Clash of Clans. I mentioned the game earlier. They're called specifically the Barbarian King and the Archer Queen. So Clash of Clans, one of the most successful mobile games of all time. If you look at their data in 2012 when it first launched, the game was doing okay. It was a good game. It wasn't phenomenal. It wasn't top of the charts for about six months or so. At one point, they just released an update and boom, they climbed to the top of the charts. And I mean within a few weeks, they went from you know, somewhere in the top 100 to number one. And they stayed number one for a good three years. What I believe happened, I haven't actually worked on the game, unfortunately, but I've worked on similar games that saw these problems. So what I believe happened is that after six months or so of being live, they were still pushing out content. And let me actually take a step back. The goal of the game, you build your base, you train troops, um, your army, and you go and attack other players to get their coins. Fairly simple. Um, but the competition helped people play for multiple months at a time and they attacked more bases and their bases got bigger and they got more and more coins. What I believe happened is that after six or so months of play, the people who are at the very top, the people who installed on day one and two, when they were playing a lot, because they played so much, they just had so many coins, they didn't need to spend money anymore. They could keep attacking their friends and, and keep engaging like that basically for free. So what they decided to do was press reset on their economy. How they did it though is a very creative way because a lot of games are accused of trying to get people to pay to be better than others, to, to be more competitive than others, to, to win, pay to win, right? That's, that's a lot of the complaints that uh, people throw at, at free-to-play games. But what Clash of Clans did is basically that, but in a very, very subtle way. <laughs> they introduced these two new units, and these units you could only get one at a time, and you could destroy everything in your path when you did that, right? Your, the other person would have theirs as well, and then you had a pretty even fight, but basically, if you didn't have these units, you were competing, you know, you were an amateur, you weren't in the pros league. Um, and remember, this is a very competitive game. So they made these new units cost a different currency. They created these crystals that you had to mine that were extremely long and tedious to get. So a lot of people decided to pay to get them. But if they had left it at that, people would say, why would I do this, right? I don't wanna just pay and, and beat other players because my wallet is bigger. So what they did is that they introduced this guild system or this clan system where the, new, the competition was a very effective part of getting people engaged and they knew that if they put it more in your face and they had people team up together and attack each other, clan versus clan, they could get people to ignore the fact that they're paying to beat others because again, when you're playing the pros, everybody's spending at that level. Um, and it was a step function change. Like the game started generating you know, a multiplier of its revenue and it stayed there for a very long period of time. I like this example in particular because it's, it's a very simple feature when you think about it, right? The guild, which is very well known, new units, which is simple, but it came together extremely effectively, both gameplay-wise and business-wise. Okay, so beyond that, when you move outside of the senior product manager role and you get into leadership or, or director roles, you move a little bit away from the individual contribution role. You'll do more management work, um, but that also means that you'll be the product owner. Um, and I do mean product owner. This is one of the really cool things about being a PM in the gaming industry is that you own your product end to end. You don't own you know, step three of the new user experience uh, for this game you get to own the full thing. So day, day in and day out, you'll be working on a ton of different parts of the game. But that also means that you are accountable for the entire product. So as a leader director, you're expected to build a forecast, a PNL, and to hit it. To do that, you'll build a roadmap of features and content to get to your goals. You'll be managing a team of PMs to work on these features and content and et cetera. And you'll be put communications on there, but you'll be your product champion in effect. You will be the one talking to management, the game company, pitching these ideas, these updates, um, and championing your product over time. It's a very challenging role, but it's a lot of fun, especially if you've been through uh, the rest of the path, because you get to step back and get that big picture view over the entire game. And you get to work with a team 
that is very engaged and very excited to be on a gaming product. So it's something I highly recommend. How big are the teams? Uh, it depends. I've worked on teams of 14, 15 people, and I've worked on teams of 60 people. Um, I think I've heard stories of Facebook games being 100 or so. Um, it can depend. I think product management teams tend to be on the smaller side. Um, I manage three people currently uh, and, an anal and a data analyst. And that, you know, depending on the game, you might get up to about 10 PMs, but it's rare that you get more um, bigger than that. I've also been alone on a lot of games, which is daunting, especially when you're more junior. But I've survived, and it's been fun. Can you get to the direct results without going up the ladder? Because it seems like it's a very specific um, industry. But you need to know mm -hmm. all the features of the game and mm -hmm. how the game was designed. Um, I've seen people brought in to the leadership role. Um, you know, if they've graduated from an MBA program or have consulting experience, kind of the, the, the broader skill set or have a lot of applicable skills, uh, we might bring them into that role and then make sure that they click well <laughs> with the, the, the industry, the process, and the people. Um, so I think it is possible, yeah. Um, to wrap up, I just wanted to go over a, a more vague definition of the product skill set, uh, maybe a little bit too vague, but I like to cover it. And um, a little bit what I what product management means to me, because it is something, or gaming product management, I should say. It is something that I've been doing for a while and that I do love. So these are you know vague buzzwords, but they are the, the types of skills that we look for. Um, the live operations piece we've talked about a lot, right? The ability to day in and day out manage a game as a service, right? You, you won't necessarily be working on weekends, but your players will be playing on weekends. So you need to be there to react and, and to know what to do when, when stuff works, when stuff doesn't work. Uh, innovation, I'm not necessarily talking, you know, the explosive, crazy innovation, oh, I'm going to create a brand new game because it is very rare that you'll actually be able to create a game from scratch. Um, some of that is helpful because it gives you outside the box thinking. But there's also a lot of innovation that you can do inside the box, for, for lack of a, a better term. There's a lot of optimization that happens in the gaming industry that seems very really simple that people don't notice, but that can be extremely impactful. So the ability to make things better over time is definitely something that we, that we value a lot in, in gaming. Um, strategy, you know, the, the, this big picture type of thinking, I mentioned that you get to be a product owner rather than just focused on a, a small step. So being able to step back and say, you know, I'm, I'm tuning some content here that will impact the players that I've played for a year or more. How will that impact the players who start today? How will that impact the players who stop playing that we're going to serve ads to so that they can come back, right? So taking that big picture approach, um, that's the type of strategy that will help you in the long run as a PM in, in the gaming industry. Analytical skill set, again, super important. I'm always terrified when I see a data analyst or data scientist that decides to be a PM because I'm like, ah, that's it, I'm done. They're going to take over. Um, because again, we get more and more numbers. You have more and more companies dabbling in, in machine learning. Um, super, super impactful stuff, super interesting stuff. If you can't keep up, it will be challenging. Um, and to my earlier point, you need to not only make the numbers say what you, well, you need to make the numbers say the truth, not make them say what you want them to say. Um, player focus. This is the one that people forget a lot about. You are dealing with, um, you know, not real life problems in a sense, but you're dealing with real human beings playing this game. More importantly, you're not one of them. Don't ever think that as a player of your own game, you understand what your players look for or want, because that's not the case. You know the game a very different way than these players do. Uh, demographically, they might be entirely different, uh, but even if they're not, you treat the game differently. So a lot of PMs spend time reading reviews, going on forums and, and figuring out what people are arguing about, going on Facebook to see what are they complaining about. And it's all quantitative data, but it's still data and it's still very relevant to, to your role as a PM. Execution, get shit done, it's pretty straightforward. Um, teamwork and leadership go hand in hand. Teamwork, you'll be working in some of the most um, you know, cross-functional is a very you know, vague buzz term, but it is very true in gaming. You'll be working with other product managers, producers, game designers, QA, artists, um, marketing people, ma uh, executive management. It's, it's across the board, and these are all very different personality types, especially when you're in a room with a designer and an engineer and trying to agree on something. That's not necessarily just true of gaming, but people are extremely passionate in the gaming industry. So being able to have this set of interpersonal skills to communicate across all that and get your point across, because at the end of the day, you are accountable and responsible for your product and you need to convince people to do what it is that you want, but you also need to listen to them. Sadly, in free-to-play, the relationship between designers and, and product managers is not always the best. Hopefully, we'll work on it. <laughs> 
Um, I think it's, uh, someone asked how come. A um, couple of things. I think game designers will think very much with the lens of uh, a gamer. And I like to say, okay, let me trace back. I like to say between producers, which act as project managers, product managers and game designers, um, the product managers will say, hey, here's what we should do based on the data. The game designers will say, here's what we want to do based on our game vision. And the producer will say, here's what we can do based on our resources. If you have three people that work very well together, it can be phenomenal. I've had that a couple of times, smooth sailing. You make compromises, but you have good, um, good dynamics. If you don't agree on those definitions, that's where it gets pretty, pretty risky. And if you don't agree on the priorities, that's where it gets a little bit testy. So my experience personally at EA at the time was that a lot of the producers came from the console world where they were the product owners. So stepping in, especially as a junior PM and saying, well, you know what, this is my p and um, you should do this was a little bit uh, hard. On the game design side, it's usually more about, um, to stay cheesy, uh, hey, you just wanna make money, right? I wanna make a good game. Um, I believe there's a middle ground. I think that great products can also monetize very well and it doesn't mean they're bad, it just means they're mainstream. <laughs> um, so working on communication and understanding priorities will help a lot. Um, it depends team to team as well, so you'll see a bit of everything. Uh, how many, how yes? Like how many team designers are in that, that group, basically? Again, it depends game to game. Uh, on my current product, we're four game designers, I think three and we have an open headcount, uh, but on my previous game, there was only one uh, because it was very specific. So I can actually talk about this more in, in detail. My, I was in a casino game for a while, which is an interesting sub-segment of the mobile industry, but basically they're slot machines, right? You, you win coins and you spend them. You can never cash out, uh, but game designers there are solely responsible for the reels, the, the, the slots, right? And these are designers from actual casinos and actual companies that come in and do that. So it's a very unique skill set. Um, everything beyond that is in the realm of the product manager. In other games, uh, I was on Empires and Allies, which was a game where you build a base and you attack your enemies. I would manage more um, the outer layer of, of features. So anything to do with uh, inviting friends or, or monetizing. All these incredibly complex systems of, you know, my tank does plus two damage if I have this power up on top of it and then my tower has this, systems designers do all that. Um, it'll depend. On some teams, you'll have more designers, some less. And it depends on the skill set and the personalities. Hmm. To me, the most important here, especially when I meet a new PM, um, innovation, but I think of it more as the way of problem solving. Can I throw a problem at you? And even if you've never worked in the gaming industry, can you find creative ways to solve it? Um, I don't necessarily care if it's the right way or the wrong way, um, but if it's an interesting way, I like that. Analytics, I've mentioned the numbers, uh, they're super important. They're just good to have in the back of your pocket. Uh, it's usually, especially when you're starting out and you're going up against bigger personalities, um, it's your strongest tool, right? Showing the data that supports your argument will usually shut up anybody who's pushing back. Um, and lastly, player focus. And what I mean by this is that I think of it myself, if I were to go to another company that is not in the gaming realm, I would be super excited for about six months. I would like the challenge of a new type of problem to solve. But at the end of the day, I don't think I would care about the product that much. I care about games a lot. I love it. I play games as much as I can, and it helps in my day in and day out. Um, and it helps, I believe, my skill set as a product manager. Everything else we can teach you when you come to a gaming company. You will learn about games as a service. You will learn how to get shit done under crazy circumstances. You learn to deal with these personalities and, and as you grow, you learn about strategy. Um, the rest is usually what we look for more in people outside of the gaming industry. All right, to finish, um, if you couldn't tell from this talk, I love games. <laughs> um, I'm here to talk about games because I love both gaming and product management. I got into gaming not because I wanted to be a product manager. I was studying finance and marketing and I was told that product managers are the people who made Colgate and Crest ads really cool. I was like, I'm never gonna do that. That sounds ridiculous. Um, but Montreal, which is where I'm from, is, is a hub for gaming and I just wanted to get my foot in the door. So I went in for the first interview I could and I got this product management role in this weird free to play thing on Facebook that I, I was sure was gonna die. They were making a Star Wars MMO next door and I was like, I'm just gonna work over there soon. Um, but it turns out that product management is, in gaming is one foot on the business side, one foot on the creative side. And that to me is a blast. I get to wear all of the hats. Um, you know, this morning I was doing a lot of mentorship with one of my, product, uh, my PMs who's taken on her own game. 
Uh, yesterday I was doing some heavy historical data analysis on a new game that I'm going to be taking on. Last week I was designing features, small and big. Um, I've done forecasting, I've done marketing plans, I've spent multiple days QAing my product before launch. Day in and day out I don't really know what I'm going to do, but I'm going to do a little bit of everything and I do it with people who are very excited to be there and to be working on games. So that's why I wanted to share this with you and hopefully I got you a little bit more interested about product management and gaming. Yeah, so the question was to talk a little bit more about the relationship between producer, production, and uh, product management. Um, it, you, in some places, it was the same role. I've seen producers that had the title producer that were product managers. Um, because the, the thing is that a few years ago, people were still figuring out this free-to-play thing. Uh, a lot of companies came that had different team structures and, and would just come in and try this. A lot of companies that had never done games would just start doing games and didn't have producers, right? More or less, the structure right now is a leadership team comprise, uh, that consists of a product manager, a producer, which acts as a project manager, so it does a lot of the resourcing. Uh, he or she will work closely with a director of engineering or an engineering lead, right, because it goes hand in hand, uh, and they manage the art and engineering teams. A game, designers, uh, game designer and um, an art lead. So these are kind of the disciplines that we deal with. You will still probably find producers that are that index very heavily on, on game design. Um, a lot of producers tend to come from backgrounds of QA. Um, they got in, they loved games, they wanted to do more. They'll go into game design path and production path um, and eventually become a producer. But they, they are extremely invested in the success of the game because they like it a lot, but the role has been very fluid over time. So some producers will want to do things their own way. Others will be very happy just managing um, you know, the, the, the resourcing and getting things done your way. Um, the director of product, at the end of the day, is the product owner. They own the forecast, um, and therefore, they own the roadmap towards that forecast. I can't say that that's the case for every game company. Um, some companies will have a, a general manager above that, those five roles that I mentioned, and they are the product owner. Um, in general, they'll be a little bit less involved in the weeds because their role is more of a, a team manager. Um, yeah, development times have grown quite a bit. Um, some of the games I first mentioned we shipped in four months, including, uh, we didn't do soft launches at the time, but from the idea, we were approached by Hasbro and they said we have this Yahtzee game, we're rebranding Yahtzee, can you make a Yahtzee game, when do you want it? Oh shit, that's very soon, we did it. Um, nowadays, you know, the devices are much more powerful, so the, the production values can be much higher. At the same time, there's a great talk online about um, audiences getting smarter over time, um, and the audience, the gaming audience, which is now much broader than it used to be, is much smarter when it comes to games. So they can interact with more complex game mechanics and they're actually looking more complex game mechanics. So if you put that together, um, you need to have better looking games, deeper games, more complex games, but still develop them within a reasonable amount of time. So that's why um, these, these development times take longer and longer. I was gonna say another thing about that, but I forgot. <laughs> um, do I think they're gonna go up with time? I would be very surprised. Uh, well, I don't think it makes good business sense for them to keep doing that. Uh, when I said that 18 months you're pushing it, there's still kind of a stigma of any game that takes more than 12 months to, I've been in a lot of rooms for uh, green light meetings, right? When you're kind of pitching an idea, how long is this gonna take, how much is it gonna cost? Um, the reason it starts to not make business sense is because you're still paying a team of growing to 30, 40, or 60 people um, to make a game that has a little bit of a, quite a bit of a risk attached to it, right? Unless there's something big like, hey, we just got Star Wars as a brand, you know, we're probably gonna be good on, on user acquisition and installs and our game is gonna be good, we make money no matter what. But beyond that, you're starting to have sunk a lot of money for a game, um, so I would be surprised. But there might still be some companies that try it. Uh, I think independent developers will err on the shorter side and, and bigger companies might err on the longer side. As far as how, sorry, second part of your question, how that would impact the PM role, uh, being a PM in development, it's not the best. Um, it is very challenging, especially early on. Um, I spent a year developing a Marvel game that never saw the light of day, so that made it even worse. Um, but you're usually alone because there's just not enough work for a product manager. You're indexing very heavily on game design and you're trying to think long term. Um, I gave the example of Clash of Clans and their, their feature that impacted later players. I would never launch a game in that genre without that feature already developed, right? So that's the type of stuff that you do when you think. And over time, then you start hiring more PMs to, to do the, the funner stuff, which is implementing the statistics um, or the, the data tracking. 
doing the economy tuning and, and progression building and all that. I don't know that there's a demographic for whales. There are demographics per genre. Um, everything in the action strategy side uh, tends to be more male skewed. Um, age range, I'm, I'm not sure to be honest. I think it's kind of like general gaming in the, the mid 30s or if, if you average it out, right? So uh, pretty broad scale. Um, in the more casual fare, uh, casino, uh, match three, etc., builders like Farmville, it's a uh, female, slightly older. Um, so we're talking about 40 and above uh, women. So um, the whales tend to reflect that. Um, yeah. Oh, professions. Um, I want to say, so we do, in some of our genres, we interview these people, we bring them into the office and we talk to them because these are people that literally spend hundreds of thousands of dollars. So if they're having a hard time, we have managers that talk to them. If they're having a hard time, you know, downloading the game, we'll send them an iPad, right? It's, it's, <laughs> it makes more sense. Um, I think professions wise, it varies. Um, I do believe we had, uh, you know, a few entrepreneurs that we've spoken to that were CEO of their co own company. They have the disposable income, right? Um, some games, um, uh, Machine Zone made a game called Game of War, which was very popular and it sparked a genre where they're very ugly games, but they work very well where you're just attacking other people. And some of them do extremely well in the Middle East where a lot of people that have access to those games have a lot of disposable income and can spend uh, tens of thousands of dollars to stay at the top of the competitive leaderboards. Okay, so a few questions there about uh, basically the role of the product management with design across the life cycle, right? Um, a couple of things, I think on the development phase, uh, a product manager will be involved very early on from the concept. Usually um, when you go to pitch a game to, to a company or the company has you know, the, the ability to launch a game at a certain point in time, they'll put together that leadership team, right? Having a game designer, a product manager, um, and put together a plan of a, a basic idea for what the game will be and a basic PNL for how much money we, we stand to make there. Um, it doesn't get much deeper than that until you actually build a prototype and start playing around and having play tests internally and figuring out what works, what doesn't work. Um, at that point, in an ideal situation, you and the game designer become best friends. And you say, this is what the game's gonna feel like, this is what, there's this concept of a, a core loop. If you've read that book, uh, Hooked, he has the, the, right, the habit loop and et cetera. It's the same idea for a game. Uh, Clash of Clans would be, you know, you build your base, you train your troops, you attack your enemies, you get coins, and you build your base, right? So you're designing that together. Uh, and the reason you're doing it together is so that um, it's not only a lot of fun, but can also be successful. Um, some game designers might just make something that's a lot of fun, but that people would not end up paying. Some PMs would make something that would just make everybody pay, <laughs> right? So you wanna find the middle ground. In live ops, when you identify problems, the trick is that you're not necessarily the person who started in concept and sees the game all the way through to the end. You can jump into a game at any point in time. Um, so if you jump into a game and you see a problem, I would still say that depending on the product manager's uh, personality, it differs. I see a lot of PMs that will just enjoy doing the work themselves and will want to do them themselves. Actually, I was at a happy hour where a very drunk PM told me that after a game launches, you don't need designers. And I walked away. I was like, cool. Um, on my end, and I think this comes from my background of, of being very passionate about games, um, I think about it this way. I'm no expert in game design. Um, why would I do everything myself, right? Why not leverage somebody else's skill set? And this, but to be honest, I learned this very early on, or much later on when I started working in casino games, because I don't know anything about casino games. I don't know anything about slot machines. Why would I say I can design a slot machine better than you when you've been doing it for 20 or 30 years? Um, so I like to pair PMs with designers. So say, um, you know, we have this feature where people, uh, after a certain amount of time, they're not, they stop playing and they leave the game. What can we do to solve that? Um, we'll brainstorm both disciplines together and then there will be, the, the, um, the product manager will be the feature owner, uh, but it is expected that he or she will work with the game designer and eventually the art team and the engineers to put together a, a product specification or spec as we call it. And then everybody signs off on that spec and we start building it. Um, the, the clash or the friction happens when PMs just do the whole spec themselves. They'll write a very long document on Google Docs and say this is how we're doing it and they hit it off and then they go do something else. Um, and then it causes a lot of issues because game designers are like, what does he mean by that? Or what does she mean by this? How do I implement that? Et cetera. Uh, so I'd rather do a bit more effort up front, have everybody involved um, without it turning to design by committee, right? Because you do need an owner that pushes things around. Um, but that's usually how I solve it personally. Sorry, first question about that, really quick. Some places have economy designers, so how do you... 
Uh, I think that's brilliant. Unfortunately, I haven't worked with economy designers. Um, there's a great, uh, what is it? Uh, Valve, the company behind Steam, the, the platform, their economy designer became Minister of Finance for Greece for a very short period of time, right when they were going under. <laughs> it was a very, very flashy guy that rode around a motorcycle, but there's a lot of economists that are starting to get more involved. I would love to get more psychologists more involved also in game design. Uh, you don't see a lot of that. Um, you hear stories of this company's doing that or that. There was a company I thought was doing AI and economy design. I met someone there and they're like, no, we just you know, change stuff every now and again. So I don't deal with economy designers. Um, in terms of building economies, it depends. Um, that very complex military game that I worked on, we had phenomenal system designers who just loved it. They did everything. Um, I have created Clash Royale in Excel because I wanted to see how that economy worked myself, right? And I have designed economies and, and tried them myself. Um, it kind of depends. Um, you do still need as a product manager to understand the economy and understand you know, when things go up and down, what are your levers, what are the sinks and the taps as we call them, where do coins go in, coins go out, um, because that is one of the, remember those little dotted line boxes, um, that's one of the things that can move the metrics later on and it can be pretty impactful. Um, so um, the, the question was if we saw any behaviors based on um, things like geography or, or time of day or etc. Um, geography, no, we don't really look at those demographics. Um, even uh, someone was asking about age and gender and etc. Beyond the generic, like, oh, hey, people, these types of people play these types of games. We don't necessarily use that in our data analytics. Um, dates do matter a lot, calendars. Uh, Christmas, you usually see a dip on the 24th and a spike on the 25th. Uh, Thanksgiving is pretty bad as well, right? Because, well, these are games that are America-centric, but uh, you will see these things happen during holidays and slightly different behavior. Uh, time of day matters a lot. Usually people come and check in at first thing in the morning and then they'll play longer sessions in the evening when they have more free time. Uh, one of my strong victories was uh, on an early game. Um, we ran sales almost every day. Uh, but our system only allowed us to do, you know, 3 p.m. UTC to 12 p.m. UTC. And I had an engineer change that to local time, your device time. And all of a sudden, everybody around the world had access to those sales. <laughs> so we got a lot of revenue from Australia who normally wouldn't be getting the sales or, or et cetera, that type of stuff. So there are a few things like that. Um, the opportunity is still limited because the, the, you're not talking about huge changes. You're talking about, you know, small to medium ones. Yes. I have a technical question. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned early on um, a mechanism that you use to push updates to games mm -hmm. without going through the whole yeah. process through the App Store. Um, could you could you enlighten me? Yes. Um, okay. How can I explain it? I'm not the most technical product manager, to be perfectly honest, um, but. That's not necessarily an issue in, in gaming. I actually enjoy it because I can just describe a feature to an engineer and instead of, and I'll get them to solve it. <laughs> um, but what I mean, so the, the client update piece, right, we submit to Apple, they take it, they review it, they put it in on the app, so you download it and you'll get all your stuff. Um, the, the content piece is more, um, the game will connect to our server, our, our company's servers, and download data from there. Uh, currently, the game I'm on just downloads these JSON files, like the, these text files that say, you know, this is um, a unit that does, you know, damage dot dot 12, and then, you know, defense dot dot 120. So if I wanted to change that unit to, you know, 20 damage and, and 300 defense, for instance, to tune it, um, I could go in, log in now, change the numbers, push it, and the next time you open the game, those changes will be in there. And more, you see more and more those, uh, the server piece being more complex, so we can assign a, a sprite or, or an art asset to the unit, and we can actually push out these new units and the, these new pieces of content without going through that uh, approval process. Um, yeah, that's the extent of my knowledge there, <laughs> but hopefully it helps, yeah. Do you test the updated content before launching it? Well, you, you said about the mm -hmm. features, you test the feature for six to eight months, mm -hmm. to 18 months, but how about the content lists? For, for example, yeah. defense, uh, this new defense mm -hmm. sprite is plus 300. Yeah, do you so test it internally? Do you play around with it with the new code? Do you have a demo and mm -hmm. you play around and this is how I feel, this is, uh, it's, it yeah. becomes too easy, it's too hard, it's not mm -hmm. good enough? Yeah, exactly. So we do a lot of that. Um, that testing has that, one of the, advantages of having that server system is that it's very flexible, right? I can do stuff right now and you'll see it uh, very quickly. I can set things up in an experiment so that 50% of users see one thing and the other. Uh, but internally, we want to test that as well. So 
uh, we call them environments, right? There's a development environment and a production environment, and you can have 12 in between. And then we'll just set up these changes on, on a, a staging environment, if you will, download those builds ourselves and test them. And we do play tests. Um, you know, we were trying to dig up this whole tournaments feature on one of my games right now when someone realized that the feature is almost done. Like, well, we should have known this six months ago, but whatever, let's just set it up and play test it. So we had all of our teams sit down yesterday for an hour, play it, take notes, see what works, what doesn't work. We had a lot of UI issues and et cetera. Uh, and then we get to building, but yeah. And we also do, once we actually do push it out to the users, we'll either push it out to say 10% or we'll, we'll push it out turned off and have our QA test the on feature and then ramp it up. And we'll monitor to see, make sure it works. Um, okay, so first, how varied consumers are in, in China or Asian markets versus the US. It is very different. Um, the best way I can explain this forever, for instance, if you open your, your iPhone or your Android phone right now and you go to the App Store, there is a list, or there used to be a list on the old OS of the, the top grossing games, the games that make the most money. In America, what you would see, or most Europe and, and the US, you would see um, Game of War, the machine zone game. Most of those games that were up there, Clash of Clans, uh, Pokemon Go is there now, right? Kind of a candy crush, all that. If you then go online and you download the most successful games of all time or the games that made the most money this year or last year, you will see four or five games that only exist in China or only exist in Japan. Um, Monster Strike, Puzzle and Dragons, these are games that only existed in Japan for the longest time and they made more money in Japan than games made in the rest of the world, right? So it's a very different market. Um, what I think, why I think that's the case, um, I, I mentioned, I think in an answer, this idea of audience intelligence. Um, they started playing free-to-play games in 2000, 2001. They started having access to that and they already, um, the, the barrier to entry, not physically but emotionally, if you will, was much lower for them. They were used to these systems. So those games are much more complex than what you see here in the US. Um, in the US and, and in the West right now, League of Legends is a huge game. It's a, um, online game where people battle each other. Uh, this is huge, but no one would play that on a, a phone. A lot of people have tried it, but the biggest game in the world right now is a game in China that does exactly just that. It actually launched in the US uh, in November and it's doing okay in the US. It's still killing it in China. Uh, my personal experience with that is uh, a lot of companies try to release their games in China in particular, right? It's a huge market. You want to tap into that. Didn't work. What you do or what we tried to do is find a partner there that can take your code, um, adapt it to the local market, and then release it. The issue there again is contracts and et cetera. How do you do the ref share? And, and once they take your code, what if they modify the game? There's, there's issues there. It's usually, you need a pretty big budget to do that. If you're an indie developer, you're probably just better off launching it yourself. 